This is the Readers or Readers Club recording. For more information or to volunteer, three. Going to die, Brian thought. Going to die, gonna die, gonna die. So Brain screamed it in the sudden silence. Gonna die. He wiped his mouth with the back of his arm and held the nose down. The plane went me to a glide, a very fast glide that ate up. A altitude, and suddenly there weren't any lakes. All they'd seen since they started flying over the forest was lakes, and now they were gone, gone. Out in front, far away at the horizon, he could see lots of them, of to the right and left, more of them, glittering blue in the late afternoon sun. But he needed one right in front. He desperately needed a late right in front of the plane, and all he saw had through the windscreen were trees, green, dead trees. If he had to turn, if he had to turn, he didn't think he could keep the plane flying. His stomach tightened into a series of rolling knots and his breath came in short bursts. There, not quite in front of, but slightly to the right, he saw a lake, L-shaped, with rounded corners, and the plane was nearly aimed all that long part of the L. Coming from the bottom and heading to the top, just a tiny bit of right. He pushed the right rubber pedal gently to the nose moved over. But the turn closed him speed and now the lake was above the nose. He he pulled back on the wheel slightly and the nose came up. This caused the plane to slow dramatically and almost seemed to stop and wall in the air. The controls became very loose, feeling and frightened. Brian made him, him push the wheel back in. This increased the speed a bit, but filled the windscreen with, once more with nothing but trees, and put the lake well above the nose and out of reach. For a space of uh, three or four seconds, Things seemed to hang almost to stop. The plane was flying so slowly, so slowly. It would never reach the lake. Brian looked out to the side and saw a small pond, and at the edge of the pond, some large animal. He saw a moose standing out in the water, also still looking, so stopped the pond and the moose and the trees as he slid over them now only three or four hundred feet off the ground all like a picture then everything happened at once trees suddenly took one detail filled his whole field of vision with green and he knew he would hit and die would die. But his luck held and just as he was uh, to hit came, he came into an open lane, a channel of fallen trees, a wide place leading to the lake. The plane committed now to landing, to crashing, fell into the wide place like a stone. And Brian East back on the wheel and braced himself for the crash. But there was a tiny bit of speed left, and when he pulled on the wheel, the nose came up, and he saw in the front the blue of the lake, and at the instant, the plane hit the tree. There was a great wrenching as the wings caught the pines at the side of the clearing and broke back 
ripping back just outside the main braces. Dust and dirt blew off the floor into his face so hard he thought there must have been some ex kind of explosion. He was momentarily blinded and sh slammed forward in the seat, smashing his head on the wheel. Then a wild crashing sound ripping of metal and the plane rolled to the right and blew through the trees out over the water and down, down to slam into the lake. Skip once, one water was hard as concrete water that tore the windscreen out and shattered the side windows. Water that drove him back to into the seat. Somebody was screaming, screaming as the plane drove down into the water. Someone screamed cut animal screams of fear and pain. And he did not know what that tore the windscreen out of tight animal screams that he roared against the water that took him and the plane still deeper down in the water. He saw nothing but sense of blue, cold, blue, green, and he wrecked at the seat belt catch, tore his nails loose on one hand. He ripped at it until it released, and somehow the water tried to kill him to end him. Somehow he pulled himself out of the shattered front wind, knowing clawed up into the blue, felt something hold him back, felt this anchor tear, and he was free, tearing free, ripping free, but so far, so far to the surface, and his lungs could not do this thing, could not hold and were through and he sucked water, took a great pull of water that would finally win, finally mm -hmm. take him. And his head broke into the light and he vomited and swam, pulling without knowing what he was, what he was doing, without knowing anything, pulling until his hands caught at weeds and musk, pulling a screaming until his hands caught at bass and grass and brush and he felt his chest on the land. Felt his face in the torso blades of grass and he stopped everything, stopped. A color came that he had never seen before, a color that exploded his mind with the pain and he was going gone from it all spraying out into the world, spraying out into nothing. There was a great wrenching as the wings caught the pines at the side of the clearing and broke back, ripping back just outside the main braces. Dust and dirt blew off the floor into his face so hard he thought there must have been some ex kind of explosion. He was momentarily blinded and sh slammed forward in the seat, smashing his head on the wheel. Then a wild crashing sound ripping of metal and the plane rolled to the right and blew through the trees out over the water and down, down to slam into the lake. Skip once, one water was hard as concrete water that tore the windscreen out and shattered the side windows. Water that drove him back to into the seat. Somebody was screaming, screaming as the plane drove down into the water. Someone screamed cut animal screams of fear and pain. And he did not know what that tore the windscreen out of tight animal screens that he wore 
against the water that took him and the plane still deeper down in the water. He saw nothing but sense of blue, cold, blue, green, and he wrecked at the seat belt catch, tore his nails loose on one hand. He ripped at it until it released. And somehow the water tried to kill him to end him. Somehow he pulled himself out of the shattered front wing. The wing clawed up into the blue, felt something hold him back, felt this anchor tear, and he was free. Tearing free, ripping free, but so far, so far to the surface, and his lungs could not do the thing, could not hold and were through, and he sucked water, took a great pull of water that would finally win, finally mm -hmm. take him. And his head broke into the light, and he vomited and swam. Pulling without knowing what he was, what he was doing, without knowing anything. Pulling until his hands caught at reeds and musk. Pulling and screaming until his hands caught at grass and grass and brush. And he felt his chest on the land. Felt his face in the torso, blades of grass. And he stopped everything, stopped a color came that he had never seen before, a color that exploded his mind with a pain, and he was going gone from it all, spraying out into the world, spraying out into the Four. The memory was like a knife cutting into him, slicing deep into with hate. The secret. He had been riding his pen speed with a friend named Terry. They had been taking a run on a bike trail and decided to come back a different way. A way that took them past the Amber Mall. Brian remembered everything in incredible detail. Remember the time on the back clock in the mall flashing 3.31. Then the temperature, 82, and the date. All the numbers were part of the memory. All of his life was part of the memory. Terry had just turned to smile at him about something, and Brian looked over Terry's head and saw her, his mother. She was sitting in the car, a strange car. He saw her, and she didn't see him. Brian was going to wave or call out, but something stopped him. There was a man in the car, a short blonde hair, a man head, wearing some kind of white tennis shirt. Brian was the, and more some the secret and some more later, but the memory came in pieces. It came in scenes like this. Terry smiling, Brian looking over his head and to see the car and his mother sitting with the man. The time and temperature clock to front wheel of his bike. The short blonde ha hair of the man, the white shirt of the man, the hot ha sizes of memory were exact. The secret. Brian opened his eyes and screamed. For seconds, he did not know where he was, only that the crash was still happening and he was going to die. And he screamed until his breath was gone. They went into the water. He tried to move into gasps and he stopped. His legs fell in the water. Pain, memory. He turned again and sun across the water, late sun, cut into the eyes and made him turn away. It was over then, the crash. He was alive. The crash is over and I am alive, he thought. Then 
His eyes closed, and he lowered his head for mi minutes. That seemed longer. Into the trees and out of the lake. Plane, the plane had crashed and sunk in the lake, and he had somehow pulled free. He raised himself and crawled out of the water, grunting with the pain of movement. His legs were on fire, and his forehead felt as if somebody had been pounding on it with a hammer, but he couldn't move. Then he went down, only this time to rest, to save some thing of himself. He lay on his side and put his head on his arm and closed his eyes because that was all he could do now. All he could think of being able to do. He closed his eyes and slept, dreamless, deep and damp. There was almost no light when he opened his eyes again. The darkness of light was thick, and for a moment he began to panic again. To see, he thought, to see is everything, and he could not see, but he turned his head without moving his body. It must be morning now, he mumbled, it almost in a hoarse whisper. As the sickness of sleep left him, the world came back. He was still in pain, all over pain. His legs were cracked and they drowned up tight and aching, and his back hurt. When he tried to move, worst was meaning throb in his head that pulsed with every beat of his heart. It seemed that the whole crash had happened to his head. It took an hour, perhaps two. He could not measure time yet and didn't care for the sun to get halfway up. With it came with swarms, small bits of it at first, and with the heat came clouds of insects, thick swarming hordes of mosquitoes, and flocks of his body made a living coat. And his exposed skin clogged his nostrils when he inhaled, poured into his mouth, then when he opened it to take a breath. It was not possibly believable. Not this. He had come through the crash, but the insects were not possible. He coughed him he coughed them, spat them out, sneezed them out, closed his eyes and kept brush brushing his face, slapping and crushing with the dozens. In moments his eyes were swollen shut and his face puffy and round to match his battered forehead. The backs of his hands were puffy, and his eyes were almost swollen, shut from the mosquitoes, and he saw everything through a narrow squint. Not that there was much to see, he thought scratching the bites. In front of him lay the lake, blue and deep. Then. He had a sudden picture of the plane, stuck at the lake down and down in the blue with the pilot's body still strapped in the seat, his hair waving. Everybody was, but still everything was green, so green it went into him. The forest was largely made up of pines and sprouts with clumps of some, ha some low brush smurred her in there and thick grass and some other kind of very small brush all over. He couldn't identify most of it except the evergreens and 
some leafy fees he, he thought might be Aspen. He'd seen pictures of Aspen in the mountains on television. The country around the lake was moderately hilly, but the hills were small, almost hummocks, and there were very few rocks except, except to his left. There lay a rocky ridge that stuck up, stuck out overlooking the lake, about 20 feet high. Destroyed. The word came. I would have been destroyed and torn and smashed, driven into the rocks and destroyed. The rocky ridge was round and seemed to be of some kind of handsome, handsome with bits of darker stone layered and stuck into it, directly across the lake from it. At the inside corner of the L was a mound of sticks and mud rising up out of the corner in good water a good eight or ten feet. At first, Brian couldn't place it, but knew that he somehow knew that knew what it was. It was a be beaver house called a Beaver Lodge in a feature film he'd seen on television. So, awfully tired and standing had taken a lot of energy somehow and drained him. He supposed he was still in some kind of shocks from the crash and there was still pain and dizziness and strange feelings. He found another tree, a tall pine with no branches until the top, and sat with his back against it, looking down one on the lake with the sun warming him. And in a few moments, he scrunched down and was asleep again.